you get this what was probably a, a really big Viking burial ceremony which ended up with a man being buried in a ship with lots of cremated animals and a ship's mast being placed in the centre of the mound so it could be seen from all around. You don't carve one of these crosses, indeed you don't commission one of these crosses unless you have a, a fair amount of resource to pay for the, for the skills of the artist, the sculptor and indeed someone to come up with the memorial inscription. Good evening and welcome to this week's edition of Exploring Island Heritage. Today we're finding out more about the island's Viking history. To find out just what influence the Vikings had on the Isle of Man, we take a trip to the Viking Gallery at the Manx Museum and speak to Curator of Archaeology for Manx National Heritage, Alison Fox. They had a legacy that we can still very much see and feel today. Essentially, the Vikings were responsible for Tynwald, so the Isle of Man Parliament that basically tells us what we need to do every day. That originated in Viking times. We also have a lot of place names in the landscape as well that were influenced by the Norse language. Also a lot of personal surnames derived from the, the Scandinavian influence as well. So if you look at a, a Manx phone book, you can see a lot of the Celtic origin surnames, but also a lot of the Norse surnames as well. So a lot of the surnames that we perhaps think more of as Manx, so Corlett and Corkill, they're actually from the Norse influence of the Isle of Man, so that's a real tangible and living legacy from the Vikings today in the Isle of Man. And what has been found? Yeah, we're very fortunate in the Isle of Man really that we have a fantastic amount of Viking material, but more importantly, a really broad range of material from the Viking period. So we have finds from what we can almost sort of term first contact when the Vikings were first arriving on the island they were probably just trading temporarily they were landing on the beaches doing a little bit of trading getting back in their boats sailing off again doing that a few times a year eventually they arrived in the island and began to settle here but we have finds from that very earliest period the beach market kind of things we also have burials from when the Vikings started settling here and again even with just within the burials we have a fantastic range. We have the really overtly pagan burial of Balatir, which is the one accompanying the male Viking. We have a female skull with the back sliced off, which is uh, perhaps alluded to in some of the early writings about Viking burial practices. We also have the Baladul Viking burial, which was incorporated into a Christian cemetery, but we're not quite sure whether that was in a good way in order to share the space or whether it was more of an imposition on the landscape saying essentially listen we're here now forget those Christian beliefs and then we also have one of the richest female Viking burials outside Scandinavia in the Pagan Lady and again she was buried within a Christian cemetery but actually respecting the Christian burials that were around her so we have that whole range of Viking burial practices on top of that if that wasn't enough for any Viking enthusiast we've got all the Manx crosses that are found in a lot of the parish churches so Andreas, Jerby, Kurt Michael or Kurt Brad and have got these fantastic pieces of Viking artwork that show scenes from Norse myths and legends but also some Christian symbolism as well and then finally we've got all the treasure which we have lots and lots of silver hoards. We have some pieces of Viking gold as well. And compared to our neighbours, we have more Viking hoards from the Isle of Man per square kilometre than anybody else around the Irish Sea, north, in the north of England, but Scotland, Wales and in Ireland as well. And what period would, I suppose, the Viking influence on the Isle of Man cover? I, I know you say it goes right through to Tynwald today, but the dominant influence on the Isle of Man, what period would that be? Yeah, we think the first contact, we, we know the Vikings were moving around the Irish Sea, certainly in the late 700s, AD 700s, and we think probably by the mid-800s, the Vikings were very well aware of the Isle of Man and starting to use it. The main Viking burials, so Balatir, Baladul, are around about AD 900, 
pagan ladies by AD 950 and then we have after that the main period of horde deposition comes in the um, AD 1000, AD 1100 and the Norse influence as opposed to perhaps the Vikings which perhaps suggest more raiding, the Norse influence on the island goes on right up until the middle of the 1200s. When you talk about Viking hordes, how is this so much in one place? I mean what's the reason behind that? The reason we have so many Viking hordes is again the Isle of Man being in um, a prime geographical position to take advantage of trade at this time. So we have this feeling of lots of deals going on in the Isle of Man, um, Vikings and people who wanted to trade with them coming to the Isle of Man and using the Isle of Man as an offshore financial centre almost a thousand years ago. And as a result of all these financial transactions, there were probably times of when society was a little bit unsettled or when the people doing the deals were a little bit nervous and for whatever reason they buried the loot, their cash in the ground, didn't come back for them and that's how we find them today. A lot of the finds have been made by metal detectorists on the island. Some of the finds have been chance finds, so people just digging for other reasons, digging roads or houses or graves or something like that. But we have the bulk of the material that we have in the hordes is silver and it's usually uh, silver coinage and also silver jewellery as well that may or may not have been cut. I don't suppose there's any way of knowing why any individual didn't come back for it because it seems like an awful lot just to leave in the ground. I don't think there is. I think there's been, you know, you can put forward as many theories you, as you like. I think the, the traditional one, the most popular one, has always been because they were Vikings, that, you know, they were off raiding and they were, they were killed in some sort of dreadful battle. I quite like the idea of just a forgetful Viking wandering around thinking what to do with that because obviously you can't put a marker in the ground saying my treasure is buried here but there's no indication to suggest that the hordes were buried for any ritual or religious purpose. They're not found with burials, they're not found with any grave markers or any other sort of ritual goods. So we do think that they were buried in the ground for safekeeping with the intention to return but you know, we don't exactly know why nobody came back to get it. You say there's a lot, a lot of coins found. I mean, what do these pieces represent? The coins really, again, represent the geographical reach, I suppose, of the Vikings and the people who were living and working in the Isle of Man at this particular period. Uh, one of the hordes that we've got on display, the Kirk Michael hoard, that has coins in it, some of which were the earliest coins that were minted on the Isle of Man, so we know we were making coins here. Some of them were minted in Dublin, some in England, in lots of different mints across England, North England, South England, but also Normandy as well. Um, we've got coins from there. Some of the earliest beach market sites, we've got three or four fragments of Arabic coins now as well so all these influences were sort of being stirred around the Irish Sea at this time and it's the coin hordes that verify that for us. We have some written sources generally about the Vikings in, in the sort of 800 and 900s, thousands but it's the coin hordes, the coins in particular that can tell us that coin had come from that place you know whether it had come directly or whether it had come through a chain of financial transactions to the Isle of Man we don't know but it would have been a, a familiar form of currency at that particular time. Curator of archaeology, Alison Fox. As we've just heard, evidence of the Viking influences on the Isle of Man can be seen in some of the Manx stone crosses. To find out more about those, we visit Old Kirk Braddon to speak to curator of field archaeology, Andy Johnson. We're talking about just over 200 carved stone monuments from the medieval period from about the 6th or 7th century right the way through to the 12th, maybe 13th century. And they range from grave markers, from very, very simple slabs of slate with just two lines crossing approximately at right angles, to some really, truly monumental memorials that are designed to remember a person who was of significance in the past. As well as that, though, there are also a small number of other monuments which are, again, carved stones, but they were probably used to decorate the fronts of altars in our keels, the predecessors of the parish churches. So quite a range. 
The ones that everybody thinks about, of course, are the Viking Age stones, the ones with the really, really intricate designs on them, the knotwork, the interlaces, the runic inscriptions, and also the, the figures of humans, of godlike personages, of beasts, be they mythological or perhaps more run-of-the-mill wild animals or farm animals. There's a real sort of cornucopia, really, of, of art on these stones. And how do you decipher those engravings, those patterns and designs and the carvings on them? What do you take from that? How do you decipher that? Well, I think it works on a number of levels. With inscriptions, we can look at the actual letters, the alphabets that are used, the languages that are used and perhaps some of the internal information like the types of personal names you know those can be names that are of Norse origin or they can be names that are of Celtic origin and there's a whole story there if you like about the arrival of people from Scandinavia and the intervening islands and how they integrate with the local population how they might intermarry how they develop relationships with the existing indigenous population so there's there's that when we look at the actual, if you like, the art, then we're in the territory really of, of art history and of looking at particular types of interlace or particular types of pattern or, or figures and looking in the wider Scandinavian and to some extent Celtic world to find parallels and look for commonalities and from that we build up, if you like, a, a kind of picture of relative dating between different types of, of art or the same types of art. So it works on a number of different levels. I think also what's important to bear in mind is that this is part of a, a wider picture which includes the, the transfer, if you like, from the kind of pagan world that many Scandinavians lived in to a more Christian world, which was the world that they migrated into, particularly in the British Islands. And there's a whole dynamic there which is extraordinarily well illustrated on the crosses, which is about this change from paganism, people being buried with weapons, people being buried in great big earthen mounds in prominent locations around the island, to people who are integrated into a society that adheres to the Christian religion and they have organised burial grounds and they're being inhumed in locations like that, not in, if you like, anonymous graves, but actually still kind of making a point about particular individuals and their, their significance. You know, you don't carve one of these crosses Indeed, you don't commission one of these crosses unless you have a, a fair amount of resource to pay for the, for the skills of the artist, the sculptor, and indeed someone to come up with the memorial inscription. Because not everybody was perhaps as literate as we like to think of ourselves as being today. Now, presumably you, you would see these sorts of crosses all over the British Isles and, and further afield. How significant is the Manx collection? Very significant. It is true to say that, you know, there's an awful lot of carved stone medieval sculpture from throughout the British Islands, from Ireland, Scotland and, and England. There's a massive project that's been going for over 20 years, run by my former university professor to catalogue and create a, a kind of corpus, to use the, the academic term, reference collection and publication of all of the medieval carved sculpture of both Anglo-Saxon origin, Irish origin, well not, not Irish but mainly focused on the English material. Ireland and Scotland and Wales are undertaking parallel investigations and publications because these stones, these uh, monuments are of international significance and the Manx material sits as equals with all of that material and in some cases is of such international significance that, um, you know, we have 
visiting academics, be they people who study the runes and the language of these stones, or they study the artistic references. And they are comparing not just with other stone sculpture, but also as we excavate more and more Viking sites, they're also looking at, uh, for instance, organic sculpture. That's, you know, material on bone, on wood, sometimes even scratched into leather. It could be on ivory, all sorts of things. And indeed, you know, we have parallels in terms of some of the stories on the Manx crosses with some timber churches that have survived for nearly a thousand years in back in Scandinavia. It's an international theme and the Manx material absolutely sits there with, with all the rest. And we're here in Old Kirk Braddon, there is a collection of crosses here. What are we looking at? We're looking at a range of crosses. Some of them are quite simple, some of them are really complicated and they date in broad terms from about the 9th century through to the 11th century. They range from, as I say, the quite simple to ones which have a great deal of this interlace and and so on for which the island has such a reputation. As well as that, though, there are also some interesting other little bits and pieces. For instance, some examples of the socket stones that these stones were originally set in. Obviously, if you're carving something that stands you know, nearly two metres high, you've got to give that a, a decent foundation. And their way their way of doing that was to dig quite a deep hole, but also to make use of a stone, a, a socket stone or a sockle, to give it a slightly more technical name, into which the slab, the thin slab, would fit into a kind of letterbox-shaped opening. And then that would be visible at ground level. And then the uh, the sort of thin end of the slab would go deep into the ground. In some cases where we've looked at this in detail it it can be at least a metre into the ground just to make sure that it stays upright. So putting one of these crosses in place, I mean the, the one directly in front of us is huge, it wasn't a small task then? No it wasn't and I think that in all of this I sort of talk of this almost like the the social history of these stones, you know they are more than simply pieces of of art, although that's no small aspect of them. They are also the manifestation of people's faith at the time, and they're the manifestation of the esteem in which an individual was held by his family or her family, or perhaps even by the wider community. And so the effort and the resource that goes into, first of all, carving one of these stones, finding the appropriate piece of stone, deciding what it is you want to illustrate and then the whole process of of actually raising it we presume at the graveside or as close as possible to the person that they are remembering would have been quite a task it really would so there's a whole other story another aspect to these stones which is about the people behind them Curator of Field Archaeology for Manx National Heritage, Andy Johnson. You're listening to Exploring Island Heritage, and on this week's programme we're finding out more about the island's Viking history. One of the best-known sites in the Isle of Man for Viking finds is in the south, and that's where we meet Curator of Archaeology for Manx National Heritage, Alison Fox. We are standing on a relatively small, unassuming hillside just outside Castletown and we are at Balladool, also known as Chapel Hill. So what's the significance of the site? It's got quite a history. It has. Balladool is essentially the Isle of Man on one hilltop. We have evidence from each of the main periods of occupation of Manx archaeology and history at this particular site and many of them are still visible in monument form today. I suppose one of the things that people will probably most associate the site with is a Viking ship burial. Yeah, the Viking ship burial that we have here at Balladool is one of the most significant and the most wealthy graves that we have here on the Isle of Man. But it was actually not the intention to excavate it when the archaeological excavations happened here during the 1930s and 40s. And it's interesting that it was found at all, really. Yeah, as I say, it was never the intention to excavate it, really. The site drew attention from archaeologists and early antiquarians in the 1800s, but it was 
was during the Second World War when a German internee, Gerhard Bursu, was given permission to excavate the site. He was actually looking to find out a little bit more information about the Iron Age fort that we also have on Balladur. And if you go onto the site now, you can see the ramparts encompassing the, the whole of the hilltop. And it was that particular part of the site that Gerhard Bursu was interested in. While they were digging that site, then they came across the Viking ship burial which was great. And there was quite a lot in relation to that. It wasn't a simple, just a ship. No, it was, we have all his uh, site diaries and his site notes. And so we have a very comprehensive record of what was found where in the ship burial. So we have the artifacts, which include really fine metalwork. So we have uh, spur buckles, belt buckles, the pins. The Viking was basically laid to rest in a linen shirt, probably with a cloak, with the pin holding it together, and basically all the equipment that he'd need for the afterlife. Uh, he was buried with cauldrons as well, knives and spears. One of the interesting things that was missing was a sword. He wasn't buried with a sword, which has led us to suppose that he was more of a, a, a trader than a raider. The ship burial itself is about nine metres in length, so it wasn't one of these, you know, fantastic, amazing Viking longships that would have gone across the North Sea, but it would have been a good size coastal trading vessel for trading around the Irish sea ports. So we think that's who was buried here. There is some suggestion that he might not have been buried alone. When Bursu was excavating, there were actually three skulls found in the ship burial and one of those skulls was too badly decayed to give any indication whether it was male or female. The other one we think was female and that led to the theory that perhaps she had been sacrificed to accompany the Viking on his journey to the afterworld. But we know that essentially the whole of the hillside contains an early Christian cemetery site and we think that that female skull is more likely to have come from that earlier cemetery site, the graves have just been disturbed when the Viking boat burial was put in. That's an interesting point that nobody knows why this site was chosen for the burial. No, we, we don't really. I think all we can do is stand here and look around, I think. If we go with the theory that he was a trader, that uh, you know he made his living from the sea, he was quite a wealthy person with the not only his personal possessions that he had with him, but also after he was placed in the boat, a mound of soil was put over him, but also that was then added to the layer of cremated animals, so ox, horse, pig, goat and dog, so all these things were also added to his, his burial. So if we assume from that that he had the wealth to do that and also the people who respected him enough to bury him in that way after he died, then I think we can look around and think that this site was significant in some form of way to the community. But also we can look around and we can see that it's actually quite a prominent site. It's quite tucked away now from the modern world. You know, you drive down Fisher's Hill and you don't really see it. You know, you wouldn't really know it was here. But once you're on top of the hill side, you can see, you know, right down towards the Calf of Man, right up to South Barule, down to Castletown, you know, over to the west as well. So it's a deceptively prominent site in the landscape, really. The earliest theories were that they were acting in a, a dominant way so they were coming in they were saying well you know this might have been sacred to you before but we're here now we're taking over and that was the view for a long long time now perhaps we might look at that slightly differently and perhaps we could say well you know maybe it wasn't so much about that maybe the vikings were saying well you know this is a place that's special to you this is your burial place we want to share this as well so we'll take up this corner and it's really difficult to say perhaps it you know it depends on your on your view of the Vikings you know maybe um, maybe it's not that clear cut I think we always have to remember that that we sort of tend to think for the very simple explanations and you know maybe it wasn't that there's no way the Vikings wouldn't have known the Christian cemetery was here even if there was no outward sign of it the Vikings would have been in the community by this stage trading and also starting to settle on the Isle of Man but as soon as they started leveling the ground to haul the Viking ship 
up to the site, they would have seen that they were disturbing these Christian graves and for whatever reason they carried on doing that and they carried on putting the, the boat burial here. That's an interesting point because we've touched on this before, this stereotype of Vikings as being sort of raiders and conquerors, but human beings are complex and it's probably safe to assume that they always have been fairly complex. Yeah, I think so. I think it's much easier for archaeologists to use, use shorthand, you know, we, we know when we say Vikings, we've got this image of Vikings, what they were, what they did, what the result was. And it's quite easy to carry on with that image, carry on with that stereotype almost. But we do have to try and look a bit deeper, really, and sort of unravel what was actually going on in the community at the time. And that, for me, is one of the really interesting things about Balladool, is to just stand up here and just try and imagine it in the different periods through time. So, you know, the early prehistoric, the Mesolithic and the Neolithic, you know, there were people sat up here just chipping away, making flint tools, you know, chatting about what happened. You know, then a couple of thousand years later, we've got Bronze Age burials being put here. Then for whatever reason, people in the Isle of Man felt a threat from somewhere and they suddenly needed to start defending the island from something from out with the island or within we don't know but whatever happened all of a sudden there was this massive capital building construction in the Iron Age that these ramparts started going up all this stonework and and wood started going up all the noise and the activity that would be associated with that few hundred years later then you've got the place as you know one of the most important early Christian burial sites on the Isle of Man. After that then you get this what was probably a, a really big Viking burial ceremony which ended up with a man being buried in a ship with lots of cremated animals and a ship's mast being placed in the centre of the mound so it could be seen from all around. So it's quite easy to stand here even on a, a fairly breezy day and just think, oh, this is lovely and peaceful. But, you know, again, you know, just trying to rewind back even a thousand years to, you know, the noise and the chaos and the smells that would have been going on when all that Viking boat burial was happening is one of the really intriguing things for me about this particular site. Curator of Archaeology for Manx National Heritage, Alison Fox. That's it for this week's programme. We'll be exploring more island heritage at the same time next week. <laughs>